One thing about knife is it's often used in street robbery. So a knife is often employed as a brandish, as a threat. <laughs> the saying used to be if somebody pulls out a weapon and holds you up with a weapon, they won't necessarily stab you. But nowadays society is changing, people are changing. There's a good chance if somebody holds you up with a weapon and you give them your wallet, that they still may cut you. The advice is still standard, you know, if somebody wants your wallet, your phone, your car keys, you should give up your shit. It's not worth dying for. You can always get more money, you can always get a new phone, you can always get more stuff, right? So if somebody stood out in front of you from a few feet and brandished the weapon, this would be a weapon brandish. And there's a few feet between you and they say, give me your fucking wallet. It's probably a good idea to give them your wallet. Maybe you would just throw it down on the floor and back away quickly. This would be um, a good idea under such circumstances. But if somebody wants to take you to a secondary location, so as an example, if somebody pulled a knife or some kind of weapon and said to you, get in the car, the advice is don't get in the car. So they say that there's no better opportunity for you to do something than on first contact. So first contact, imagine you're in a car park, somebody steps out in front of you, get in the fucking vehicle. Attempted abduction, maybe of a woman. If the weapon was employed as a brandish or a hold up in order to make that threat um, active and to make it capitulate, the recommendation would be that you fight right there and then. Because statistics clearly show that if you get in a vehicle and go to a secondary location, there's a good chance that you won't come back from that. Because if you want to do something to that person where you need to be in a secret environment with nobody else around, there's a good chance that's not going to be good for you. Does that make sense? So there's a good chance that if you got in the vehicle, you'd be bound in some way. You could be chloroformed and put unconscious. You could be taken somewhere where there'd be more people Somewhere that's secluded, no one will hear you, no one will see you, no one will help you. So the best advice would be fight back on first contact. So that could be a, a, an attempt at abduction of a woman. That could be a, a journalist working in Palestine who is potentially a, a kidnapped. It could be any number of reasons that somebody tried to put you in a vehicle. The advice would be fight like fuck right now. There's never going to be a better chance. If the motivation is robbery, they want a material object off you, then I would say give up your shit. But you could give up your shit and still find that you're in a situation where you're going to potentially get hurt and get cut. In which case it's useful to understand how to deal with such a situation. If somebody gets in proximity to you where they could hold you up with a weapon, so understand what I mean by that. What I mean by that is they get close enough to your body to hold you in some way and index a weapon to part of your body, regardless of where that is, whether it's here in the groin, whether it's up against your neck. If somebody gets this close to you to be able to do that, you've made some fucking mistakes. Do you agree? Yeah. But people do make mistakes, you know. There can be lapses in, uh, in concentration by anybody, you know. It could be that I was momentarily fixated doing something, I missed this guy's approach, and now all of a sudden I'm here. I want you to understand that if you were taken by surprise and suddenly you had cold steel of a blade against your neck, which literally with just one movement could like bleed you out and kill you on the spot, potentially you would feel very scared. Do you agree? The first emotional response that's going to hit your body will be one of shock. And this is what most self-defense instructors don't address. So they might start the self-defense class with, okay, today we find ourselves held from behind with a knife to our throat. And now we must do this, 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 and this. The kind of person that teaches this kind of lesson has no real understanding of violence. No real understanding of how violence will make you feel and probably no practical experience whatsoever. I would say this kind of person is just regurgitated the pellet and is teaching what his instructor taught him and what his instructor taught him. Somewhere along the line, somebody somewhere had some real experience and then it got passed on and on and on and on and on and eventually diluted 
to the point where it's just academic study. Do you understand me? Yeah. So what I want to put forth to you first is, is an understanding that how you would feel if somebody secreted themselves from view, got close enough and then suddenly, venomously put a knife to you and threatened you, you would feel scared. Your asshole would be the size of a manhole. <laughs> and your heart rate would massively escalate. And along with that escalation in heart rate, certain physiological effects of adrenaline would kick in. The first thing that would happen is your vision would completely tunnel. Your, uh, you would experience auditory exclusion where you couldn't hear clearly. Your breathing would be shallow. Your heart rate would be very high. Blood would leave your extremities and your legs would really shake. And your cognitive ability to think and make tactical decisions would now be impaired. Basically, you're left with the limbic system part of your brain and the intelligence of a dog. So unless you train under stressful conditions to deal with a situation like this, or train in a spontaneity type of scenario situation, the reaction that's likely to come out is not likely to be the, the, the reaction that's trained by academic self-defense advocates. So it's quite simple for you to practice the principles of dealing with a knife hold up in a very comfortable environment. This is a comfortable environment. We have a nice soft floor. We have uh, nice people to train with. Everybody's compliant and nice. There's no threat here. There's no danger to your life, is there? Here we are just practicing violence. No matter how hard we take our training, we are pretending. You all know that, right? We're using training weapons and we're pretending to have bad intent. That's a very, very fucking different thing to somebody with a real knife that would kill you and the real intent on doing so. That would make you feel massively different. So the first thing is, physiologically, and psychologically, your ability to respond will be impaired greatly. Which means the response that you employ must be simple. The good thing about combatives is, is that they are principle based. They are not technical based. So most martial arts have techniques set in a certain way that if you don't do them a certain way, they will fail. And what that doesn't allow is, is Murphy's Law. When Murphy's Law enters the equation and something, some variable happens, the technique usually falls apart. Whereas principles usually stay reasonably stable. So as an example, the principles for dealing with a knife holder. The first thing is, if you've got in proximity to put a weapon to my body, then I've made a fucking mistake. I had no awareness. <coughs> Many people have said it before. It's not fucking Star Trek. You didn't just materialize next to me. There was a pattern of behavior that led you to getting close to me. Had I been switched on, I would have possibly have spotted that pattern of behavior. Which would have been, you're hanging around probably with no reason to be somewhere. You've got too much attention of what I'm doing. You're walking towards me. You're looking around like your head's on a swivel as you're walking towards me. Your hand goes concealed and you access a weapon, then you close distance suddenly and then you put the knife here. Well, where was my attention while all those other things were happening? If my attention was present and I was switched on, I would never end up in this situation. But we can never say never and we can never say always. Anything can happen. It could be that you are perfectly well switched on. So an example might be you're in an elevator and a man gets in the elevator. And let's say he's an experienced criminal who's good at using deception. He walks in, you're alert, you're aware, and you're switched on, and you're aware of the fact that this person's a stranger. But he puts you at ease very quickly by smiling and talking and just chewing the fat and talking about his day. So now all of a sudden you think he's just a normal guy. And then maybe as you do something else, all of a sudden he puts a knife to you. So you could be the most aware person in the world and still get caught out. Do you get my point? So let's work off the premise that it's a situation like that. The first thing that will be present is an adrenal flood. So what's important when you train any kind of principle, you first of all isolate it statically like we are going to. So we're going to practice the principles of a knife hold up with compliance. So we are going to both know what we're doing. We're both going to respond to each other's reaction just for the purpose of learning. Do you understand? 
Once you understand any principle, you should throw compliancy away and then put it under stress. So the way we would put this under stress would be, I put you in a, a, a simulation or scenario training environment where first I would pre-fatigue you with exercise, I might make you close your eyes and spin you around to disorientate you, and then I might make you keep your eyes shut, hands down, and then something will happen. It might be a knife hold up, it might be a tackle, it might be a grab in some way, you might get pushed against the wall and punched, any number of things. And now we see what your response is like. Do you understand? Eventually you should take all this kind of training and all these type of principles into the realms of spontaneity training under stress. Where the person realises if I hold you up with a knife and you don't seize the limb properly, well now I'm just going to stab you to bits. That would be non-compliant. Now you find out if your principles and your skill set works or not. But the building blocks to get in there is first training with a degree of compliancy and understanding the principles. The principles for a knife holder are, first of all, regardless of where he holds me up, I need to get my hands in proximity to where the weapon is. So if he was to hold me up low like this, my hands need to be close to the weapon. They're no fucking good up here. If he holds me up to the neck here, my hands are no good down here or up here. I need to get them in proximity of where the weapon is. And my body language and my demeanour and the way I hold my body needs to indicate to him that I am compliant. I am not going to give you a problem, I'll give you what you want. Now he is psychologically winning in his brain and he's getting his own way. Does that make sense? So I'm not going to let him hold me up like this and go, fuck you. you know? <laughs> I'm not going, yeah, what are you going to do? I'm not going to do this. I'm going, oh, I'll be cool. What is it you want? I'll give you whatever you need. My money's in my pocket. I'm going to use deception. I'm going to act as if I'm scared. Because you will feel scared. I would feel scared. So I'm going to use that to a tactical advantage to get my hands in proximity to the weapon. Does that make sense? So that's the first principle. The second principle, regardless of where the knife is, I need to clear the line of assault. So if he holds me up here in some way and I get my hands in proximity to the weapon, clearing the line of assault would mean moving this away from me and me away from it at the same time. Does that make sense? So this would be clearing the line. This here would be clearing the line. This here would be clearing the line. As I clear the line of assault, I need to seize the weapon bearing limb. That will be done with one or both hands. There's absolutely no point in me seizing or clearing the limb, letting it go to do my thing because he's going to be active with the blade. Once I get my hand on the weapon bearing limb, I hold on to it until this is over. Do you understand? I do not let go under any fucking circumstances. So what that means is, let's say for a point of argument that he holds me up here, and I instinctively clear with both hands. Now both hands are used, they're spent. I'm not going to do anything funky like switch grip and hit with this hand or anything like that. It's not going to happen. What's going to happen is I'm going to seize this, have a death grip because I'm so fucking scared, and be left with what other weapons are left. So in, this, in regards to this situation here, the only weapon I have left, closest weapon nearest target, is this knee, then this headbutt, and then maybe ah, this bite, which will make him drop the weapon. If he held me up in this way to the side, I clear, but now I can clear with one hand, leaving this hand free to deal with him. But under no circumstances will I let the weapon go. You understand? So the principles are, get hands in proximity to wherever the knife is. Clear the line of assault, so move it away from you by grabbing hold of it as hard as you can. The only thing left now is attack continuously with the closest weapon to the nearest target. In this case, it will be whatever it is. Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. First example, I'm here, let's say I'm fixated, let's say I'm doing something. He's come from a blind side and he's pushed the, the knife to the side of my neck in this way. Most people, when they hold you up with a weapon, will be demonstrative with the weapon. They want you to feel it and in some instances they want you to see it. So I can tell you from experience from my youth, 
from knowing certain people, let's say, if they held you up with a weapon, quite often they would put it right to your face, right to your face under your eye, or across your nose and across both of your lips as they hold you up. So now you feel this cold edge and you see this. This will make you massively capitulate. Do you understand? If he puts the weapon close to me, he's not going to hold it here like this. He's going to put it into me. He's going to push it and lift me up on my toes. He will probably use some kind of dialogue that will not be loud, but will be quiet and sinister as he threatens. So it'd be something like this. You fucking want me. Well, touch your fucking butt. Like this. He's going to be intentful. So it's important that you plug that in when you're training the principles for this. It's also important that you use deception. You know, all right, look, I'll give you what I want. My money's in my pocket. Let me get it. If he wants to get paid at the end of the day, if he wanted to hurt me, to stab me, he'd have just stabbed me. And the honest reality is, if he can get this close to hold me up, then he could have got this close and just killed me. Do you understand? So you've made a big mistake if there's no awareness in place. It's important that you have a contingency plan for the what if. Well, what if I've had a row with the wife, I've had a stressful day, I've got a busy day at work, I've got lots of things to do and I'm preoccupied. Well, guess what? You're human and now you're not switched on as you should have been. And now you find yourself in a situation like this. Does that make sense? So it can happen to all of us. So let's look at these principles in play. Now, a couple of um, examples and then we're going to apply it to impact. So like I said before, it's very important that anything you do, you translate your physical response to hitting something hard. Because he's got no protection or body armor, I have to place my shots on him. So the idea would be I get a helmet on him, I get a groin guard or whatever else, and now when he holds me up with a weapon, I'm going to wail on him. But we can also translate what we're doing here to a degree to an impacted focus pad or a tire pad as we'll see. But for now, here's the principle. It's good to work to a wall because quite often these things will happen in an encumbered environment where you could be held up against a wall while you're sat next to somebody on a bus with a wall next to you in an elevator, in a toilet, in a stairwell. The environment will most often be more productive to the criminal and less productive to you. But it's really a matter of perspective. If I'm in a confined environment such as an elevator, or a seated position or a stairwell, I don't look at that as a negative, I look at it as a positive. Because I can hit fucking hard with all my tools, but I can't hit you as hard as that wall would hit you when I smash your head into it. Do you understand? So environmental damage, i.e. using a wall, a corner or an edge, can be brought into this as we'll see. But here's the first example. He's going to use right dominant, because most people are right dominant, although you should practice both sides from any position. And he's going to come up and he's going to hold me up from the side here. There'll be dialogue involved and it's also encumbering my arm in this way. First principle, get your hands in proximity to the weapon. Second principle, clear the line of assault and then <laughs> drill the fuck up until he's down and then get gone. What you hit him with is your choice. Make it logical for yourself. So if you're not left dominant, you should learn in your training how to use both hands. So if you're right dominant and you've cleared with your right hand and now used it, your right hand is gone. I put it to you that it would be useful to learn how to use your left and use the rest of your tools. You know, it's unlikely that you're going to do this, then switch hands and then hit. The position will never favour you. So in UC, what we do very early is we learn our basic hard skills with the dominant side and then we quickly translate it to the other side. Most of my students get to the point where they can use left and right side at the same level. And that's a useful thing. If you can use your right hand and only your right hand, but after three months of training your right hand is as good as your left hand, you're now twice the fighter you were, aren't you? So why wouldn't you train it? So in this case, quite often, if you're clearing or grabbing something with your dominant right hand, which is instinct, that means your right hand as an attacking tool is not available. So you need to learn to use other options. So the option in this case then is from here, if he holds me, hands in proximity, clear the line. From here I've got this shot to the head as a straight shot. I've got this knee to the low line, followed by this elbow, repeatedly smashing the back of his head into the wall. 
I'm not going to let go of this till I hear it drop and I see him slump. Do you understand? This would be one example. Another example might be he puts it somewhere else on my body. Here, so this time he's put it here. So I understand that there's a need to pause and assess and think during a mindset where you can't think very clearly. So imagine all of a sudden this guy's held you up with a knife and your cognitive ability to make decisions is impaired. I put it to you that if you just hastily react, there's a good chance that you'll cut yourself. So in this situation here, if you hold me, this works really well. But in this situation here, it doesn't do me much good, does it? <laughs> if he holds me up here, I need to be doing this now. But if I do that, when he holds me like this, what have I just done? So there's a need to assess where the blade is and think during a time frame where it's very difficult to think. That's why you should put this kind of shit under stress. Does that make sense? Right, and a good thing to do it with is a red marker pen. So if you do it with a red marker pen under spontaneity stress, then when you've cleared the weapon, if there's a big strike down here, you didn't think, did you? Do you understand? So it's very important that in this moment I assess, and you can do that by being tactile. So I'm like, alright man, be cool now, what the fuck do you want? Just be cool, I'll give you what you want. And very lightly I'm feeling this. If I can feel the blade edge here, then I know where it is. And in this case from here, hands in proximity, Clear the line. Now I've used both hands. For me, what I've got as a high line target is this head part of his in proximity. Well, not this knee. But what's usually always available once you've got the hand seized is the bite. So people say, I don't want to bite the hand that's holding the knife. Well, I put it to you, if you ain't got no fucking choice, what choice have you got? Imagine you're in a car and the person is in the back seat and leans around the front and puts a knife to your throat. Do you get your hands in proximity to the weapon and you clear it? Well, what other weapon options have you got now other than to bite this fucking thumb off? You ain't got anything, have you? So biting is always useful. It's common sense. Don't take a mouthful of the knife. Take a mouthful of his hand. Do you understand? So in this case here, if I clear this line, I just want to ah! like this. You know, even simulating it gives it the response I want. Now from here, bam, 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 now I can work and I can operate it. You understand? I'm not going to tell you, do this, then this, then this. Because this is not left with someone here, right with someone here. This is principle based. Get your hands up near the weapon, clear it, hold on to it, and beat the fuck out of him with whatever you got left. Does that make sense? That's a principle. So here's two examples. He holds me up, here, here, hands in proximity, clear the line, back. Gone. Hold you up from the other side. Yeah. Hands in proximity. Clear the line. Yeah. Yeah. Get gone. Yeah. If it's a low line assault, sorry. Come on, bro. Come on. If it's a low line assault, so imagine you're at the ATM. You're vigilant when you go to the ATM. You're here, you're vigilant, you look around, there's no one around. You get your transaction, you get your money. Now all of a sudden he comes here and puts it to your low line. He, this is where you are. Do you understand? <laughs> so he's here. At this point, if you hold the blade to down here, I'll probably give you anything you want. Because <laughs> so I don't want to fucking lose that, right? So from here my hands are in proximity. So the first thing I want to do is clear the line, clear this away, and me away from it. So it's this. But now I've got no hands. Well, I've got a head button, <laughs> spiky, <laughs> bite, get <laughs> on Do you understand the principle? So what's important? What's important is that you quickly translate things to impact. So you understand the principles. Hands where you can use them, clear the line, seize the weapon, hit with whatever's available. But you should practice with impact. So like I said, the best way to do that is to put on kit, Work in a different environment, take it in the restroom, in the elevator, in the stairwell, make it spontaneous. But impact is the key ingredient. So to a degree, you can put impact in here if you use a pad, if you use a long pad or a focus pad. It doesn't work well from all positions, but it gives you an idea from the two that we've just looked at. So if he now has a tire pad on his left hand, 
and his knife in the dominant right hand, and we revisit what he just did, where he's holding me up in this way. First thing I want my hands in proximity to the weapon. So for me, I'm going to clear and seize the line. Now I've got target. <laughs> so I can hit. As soon as he gives me target down and drops to one knee, I sit man down and I'm gone. In this case, all that's replicated is that I cleared this line and hit him in the head repeatedly. That's all I've done. If we work from the example that he came from this side here and I actually seized it with both hands, now I have no hand assault. From here I had that bite, but the closest weapon I have to the nearest target is this knee to his groin. So from here I need to bring this foot up and then drive this knee in, more like a pendulum step. So the way it will work from here when he holds me up, he's giving me this kind of energy with some dialogue going on, my hands are in proximity, I clear the line and seize the limb and then I drive this knee in. From here he might give me a transition of a hard to high target, no, my head back, ah, and I bite and I run. Do you understand? So I want you to work these two options, just getting the feel of actually hitting something hard. In this case, a tight hat. I'm going to pass you over to training. This innovation or this addition to the way that we train this comes from Jamie. So Jamie's a first generation instructor, been with me for 10 years, and he's developed many good ways of improving our training. So this comes from him, so I'm going to let him teach it. So I'm fast. Oh, man, I don't want to push. Push, 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 push,